All right, ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce to you our president of the Hartford Foundation, Mr. Jay Williams. Well, good evening. Thank you, Stephanie, for the always exuberant introduction that uh, you know, really sets the bar, so hopefully I can be as entertaining as the introduction was. If not, I'm in trouble. Uh, well, welcome. Thank you all for joining us here this evening. I can't tell you how excited we are uh, to be here in Bloomfield, to have an opportunity to hear from uh, you as residents, as stakeholders. Uh, I know some of our nonprofit partners here. Uh, and let me just set the context. This is the 12th uh, conversation, listening session that we have had in our endeavor to touch every one of the 29 communities at the Hartford Foundation for Public Giving serves. And we made a commitment last year to come uh, and reintroduce ourselves to the community uh, to really take the time to approach our work in a different way, with humility, with flexibility, uh, taking on more risk, being informed by what the stakeholders have to say. And there is no better way to do that than to hear from the stakeholders uh, in their own hometown or the town that they're currently residing in. So we're going to show a quick video, but I just want to tell you the robustness of the turnout here, the energy in the room is palpable. Uh, as I was coming in, uh, this is our largest of the 12 thus far. Uh, and as I was coming in, absolutely. <laughs> and, and let me tell you, I, I am so impressed. As I was coming in, I mean, there I saw a license plate from Texas. So <laughs> I, I don't know what that means, but I mean, we're drawing folks from Texas here to Bloomfield to have a conversation so god bless you you know so we will start off uh with a quick video just to set the context and then really get into the conversation because like i said i mean this this isn't for me to stand here and give a monologue or a soliloquy this is for us uh myself and, and the many staff members who are here to hear from you we've got a couple of opening leading questions but this is about uh the town of bloomfield and and, and how we can be a better uh, partner, how we can be more impactful, how we can be a more valuable resources to the aspirations of the residents and the stakeholders here. So we'll start off with our video. So, you want to leave a legacy? Why not send me to college? Help me be a better provider. Or help support local programs. At the Hartford Foundation for Public Giving, through your generosity, we make both big and small dreams come true. This isn't just a donation, this is an investment. Through our careful financial stewardship, your money will last forever, helping numerous nonprofit organizations in the 29 town greater Hartford area, changing countless lives along the way. It's a tradition that goes back to 1925. The Hartford Foundation for Public Giving is one of the oldest and largest community foundations in the country. We help donors impact the issues they care about, such as education, health, the arts, economic and community development, early childhood, and more. This is your community, and it's our community too. More than 90 years of experience means we understand the big picture, how different issues connect, and what will be needed in the future. The Hartford Foundation is invested in the vibrancy of every town in Greater Hartford. We award grants, share knowledge and data, influence public policy, host events, and build partnerships. But most importantly, we help people like you make a difference. Whether you want to establish a scholarship, join a giving circle, or start your own donor-advised fund, we are here to help. We'll make sure you reach your philanthropic goals, whatever they may be. The gift you give today will make an impact now and for years to come. It's about making Greater Hartford a better place, and you can make a difference. We promise. So, what will your legacy be? The Hartford Foundation for Public Giving, together for good. So, we are a community foundation, a geographically based community foundation that serves 29 communities in the Greater Hartford region. Uh, and while we're a regional foundation, one of the oldest and largest in the country, the oldest and largest in the state of Connecticut, we are your community foundation. We are the community foundation of Bloomfield. Uh, and to that extent, we want to uh, have an opportunity to really hear from you about, while we've been around for, you know, we're in our 94th year, uh, we have benefited from the philanthropy and the generosity of uh, hundreds and hundreds and thousands of individuals and families and organizations from across the region. 
we recognize that the landscape has, cha landscape has changed, the times have changed, that although we've gone about our work in a very diligent way, uh, that we have to uh, look introspectively about how we're doing our work because we want to continue to be relevant to all of our stakeholders in our communities and we want to continue to be impactful. And we want to do it in ways that are directly uh, informed by uh, conversations and the aspirations. So this evening, uh, that's what we're here to hear. Uh, what are the things that you love about Bloomfield? What are the things, uh, what are some of the aspirations you have for the town? What are some of the things that frustrate you? What are some of the things uh, that you have concerns about? Uh, those things uh, are important to us to help us understand, better understand how to go about doing our work uh, in new and, and different ways, how to perhaps continue and, and, and scale or go deeper in ways that have been impactful in ways that aren't working, how to figure out new approaches. Uh, and that is best served by coming from you. So uh, this is where we'll get started. There was a lot of energy, a lot of discussion. Uh, so I know this is not a shy group. Uh, I was, uh, you know, and I, I was watching Nancy as she was doing this and, and she's pretty straightforward. Uh, she was in effect, not in effect, she just outright told me to keep my uh, responses short. She said, if you have something to say after, she said, keep it short because we have a lot of folks here. So I will, I have been duly instructed and directed by my staff to do that. Uh, so let's open, let's really open it up. Questions, comments, observations, perceptions, feelings about the foundation, but more importantly, about the town of Bloomfield and how we can be a more impactful, valuable partner for you know, the coming years, the coming decades, uh, because we uh, exist in terms of our resources in perpetuity uh, for the benefit of residents and stakeholders of the town. So I'm just gonna open it up, and, and if uh, you know, after a few seconds there are no hands, uh, I've always say if you make direct eye contact, that's a signal, signal to me that you have something to say. So either put your hand up or look away, avert your gaze. <laughs> One way or the other, we're gonna get our conversation started. So I'll open up the floor. Yes. Right behind, right behind you. Right. Since nobody wants to go, I'll, I'll start it. So, okay. Uh, Lori Julian, I'm a 20 year uh, resident of Bloomfield, almost 20 years. October 1998 will be 20 years. And it, we moved here originally because of the small town feel. And uh, in between beautiful places, we have Simsbury, uh, we have a popular West Hartford, but yet we're close to the city. So able to get in and out real quickly, but yet Bloomfield at the, to at the time had a rural feel to it much more. I, mean, I understand times change and economics. So my main concerns are uh, number one, keeping the Open space, keep an open space, which has always been my interest. And then also, what has become a problem is the traffic in Bloomfield. And so, uh, I think we can learn a lot from our, from our neighboring towns, especially Simsbury, that is a bike friendly uh, town, a community, as well as West Hartford, which has. I believe three times the population of Bloomfield, and I know they're different, but they have already advanced and have uh, traffic calming techniques on the roads. And I, I know that uh, a lot of people use our streets, our, particularly our residential street. I live on Maple Avenue. And so I, I would uh, advocate for uh, bike friendly paths, or bike friendly lanes, I mean, traffic calming. So, so people can walk, and I, I know that, uh, that uh, our health is important in Bloomfield, maintaining our health, so that's why I think that uh, we, we could make our streets a, uh, more pedestrian friendly, Thank bike you. friendly. Thank you. And, and uh, your comment actually uh, reminded me of two things I didn't do. One is thank uh, Senator, State Senator Beth Bai uh, for hosting us. She is the director of the Our Farm here, so thank you for opening this facility. And when you talked about open space, the fact that we are here at our farm uh, is directly related to uh, uh, donors to the Hartford Foundation uh, amongst our largest donors uh, and most historic donors, the Arbach family, uh, and their generosity, which has allowed and facilitated not only where we are here uh, today, but so many other things 
across this community. So the preservation of that feel of the town while balancing the notion of economic development uh, and the increased activity that comes along with that. Uh, you know, again, that's what we want to hear, those priorities and, and figuring out where we can be of assistance and working with, obviously, that involves uh, you know, the public, uh, uh, the town, municipal town leadership, uh, but to the extent that that becomes a, a priority uh, and there are areas for us to, to collaborate, uh, we, we very much welcome that. Thank you. We're hosting this and coming out and you can see a lot of people find this very important. We're so, excited to be thank here. Thank you. Yes. Hi, um, Beth By as director of Our Farm in Bloomfield. One of the most common calls that I get here is from, there are sort of two populations. Um, parents of kids with disability who've turned 18, 19, 21, 22, who say, my kid loves animals, they need a job, they need some job skills, can they come work here? And then parents of 18 to 23 year olds whose children maybe went to college and, and didn't finish or just looking for a link to job skills. And I'm sure other nonprofits experience that as well in town. There's just no capacity to, to do that sort of thing. So there are these job training, but People are desperate for those job skills for young adults, whether with disabilities or not with disabilities, trying to find some track for them. So I would say as a nonprofit in town, that's something I experience regularly. I appreciate that. And that speaks to uh, our, our investment in, one of our investments in, in our Career Pathways Initiative, uh, seeking to build the capacity and, and, and figure out uh, collaborative investments with organizations that provide those. And, and we've heard, while there is a, uh, you know, the economy is doing very well and has been doing very well uh, for a number of years, uh, th there are still individuals, as you described, who have not been able to benefit uh, often, very often, because of the lack of those skills. And, and, and even in an economy that is with unemployment under 4%, uh, there are still employers, both large and small, who can't feel certain positions uh, because they can't find individuals with those skills that we've sort of gotten away from. So I think that speaks to the importance of uh, our career pathways initiatives. But again, uh, our, us being one part of it, it really is those nonprofit organizations uh, that you talked about that also need to, uh, to the extent we can help bring them together with the employers. Because getting the skill sets, uh, it's important that those skill sets are directly relevant to those employers' needs. So to the extent that we can help broker those conversations, uh, we appreciate that. Yes. Right. Well, piggyback on your last comment, one of the concerns we have in town with regard to youth and education is the um, need for greater contact with the business community and help to train some of these young people to, with job directions. Not that school necessarily has to be a job training program, but the, the need for STEM programs and, and community involvement is increasing when state and federal budgets are decreasing, which was traditionally the areas in which where the money came from right. for these kinds of activities. Right. While, while the federal government has passed a new tax package, putting more, peop more money in, in po pockets of business and wealthy individuals, it sort of speaks to the need for those businesses and wealthy individuals now to pick up the social costs that were once being uh, handled. Uh, that's a real issue. We have kids who are in school who are, who are not motivated by uh, opportunity in that way. So I want to just mention that, but also to pick up on the earlier comment. You know, I've been in this town for 50 years. I came here because of the diversity of population, the wealth and wonder of open space and park facilities, and the small town feel. And um, I think uh, we see every day that it's improving. And we're, we're, uh, so I, I'm thrilled to have a group like this here. I volunteer here at our farm, and also I'm on the town council. So, uh, uh, name is David Mann. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I hope that everybody that comes out here, uh, many faces I'm familiar, uh, who do participate in town activities, I hope you'll come more frequently and participate, because this is a community that wants to be outdoors together, wants to work together and not be held up, closed up in our homes. So. What a wonderful sentiment. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. The lovely woman in red. I'm sorry, I saw your hand. Yes, ma'am. Betty Hardison, 
Bloomfield, 57 years. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. Yeah. Um, I appreciate the fact that the Hartford Foundation funded an after-school program for one of the grammar schools in Bloomfield, and I hope they continue to do that. Thank you. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Can we stay local? Uh -huh. Hi. My name is Paris Reed, and I've lived in Bloomfield most of my life. I've noticed that there's a big change in Bloomfield right now with all the new developments. I've seen condos, houses going for a million dollars. That was not the case a couple of years ago. I was here when Cottage Grove Road was only a two-way road. The Copaco was a butcher farm. I've recently noticed that big monstrous apartment complex that they built over by Bloomfield Avenue. How that got passed, I don't know because it's in the middle of the road. Um, and what I've noticed is that the apartments or housing in Bloomfield are becoming so expensive that there is very little affordable housing left in Bloomfield. I mean, there's apartment costing $3,000. That was not the case before. A lot of people can't afford $3,000 apartments, and it's pricing out um, low income to moderate income. And if you're renting an apartment for three, three $4,000 a month, that's not housing that can that provide with children. Parents, not a lot of parents can afford that with kids. Those apartment prices are for young people. You know, it's not for our family. So my big concern is right now we're losing, where we've probably lost affordable housing in the town of Bloomfield for families. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I can tell you that that is a concern that is shared by, uh, I was here uh, with one of my staffers about a month ago with the mayor, uh, and we had that conversation about um, Bloomfield being able to attract a diversity of, of residents, uh, not just in terms of race and ethnicity, I mean, that's, that's important, but in terms of uh, those residents who are uh, starting in the early part of their careers and, and who may be single and looking for uh, that type of housing, those residents then you know, grow a little older and decide they want to have a family, and the idea to be able to have that family and stay in Bloomfield uh, and not have to you know, move to another community. And then as uh, those families grow and, and maybe add another a child or so and, and, and get, begin to mature, and they go through the spectrum of then being able to uh, you know, choose to retire in Bloomfield. But the whole notion of having a variety of housing for those who, you know, and that's a wonderful thing to have folks in the community who say they want to pay the million dollars for their home and, 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 and wonderful that that's an option, but at the same time, not having that come at the expense of, of a family who you know, may have one, two, three, or four, any number of children, or multi-generational families. You know, for those individuals that have, uh, you know, my wife and I, we find ourselves in that regard of having a seven-year-old son uh, with us, and um, uh, my mother, who is seven, who will be 71 next month, both with us, uh, amazingly, both very energetic and active uh, and provide you know, unlimited moments of comedy seeing a seven-year-old and a 71-year-old interact in ways that, that uh, we just couldn't imagine. But the point is having that, this community continue to, to have that. And it is a difficult balance sometimes to, to uh, welcome growth and investment, uh, but still maintain that balance. So I can tell you that that was very much uh, both the mayor and the town manager as we had this conversation uh, just a month or two ago, uh, expressed that as as a as an aspiration and a goal of the town of Bloomfield. Claudia. how many years I've lived in Bloomfield. Um, I want to say that we had a political revolution here last summer, and I think that I see a lot of familiar faces here from that uh, community effort, and it was a really amazing experience. Um, my question is about the strategic plan. I know that it isn't that long ago that Hartford Foundation did a strategic plan, and then you came, and this is so great, and we're delighted you're here. And I wonder if you can give us any ideas, to, if you can share any ideas about what you think will happen next. Sure. So uh, the last few strategic plans of the Hartford Foundation have been three-year strategic plans, and, and there's no magical number that says it has to be three years. But you want it to you know, be long enough to get things done, but not so long where uh, you know, it doesn't become relevant anymore. So we are in the third and final year of our current strategic plan. That strategic plan has focused 
on education, learning birth through college. It's focused on vibrant communities, which is a, a broad encompassing from arts and culture to basic human needs and, and social services. Uh, and it's focused on family and economic security. So as we are in the midst of uh, putting together the framework of our next strategic plan, I'll give you a little bit of insight. I don't want to get in too much trouble because we haven't, we haven't talked to our board yet. So if I reveal too much and the board decides they don't like it, you may be seeing a new president of the Hartford Foundation you know, this time next year. Uh, but I think it's fair to say that uh, we are not abandoning by any stretch of the imagination uh, our investments in education, in arts and culture, in social services. But what you will see is that we are using data and we are learning from uh, our work and from our stakeholders and from our subject matter experts uh, and, and, and taking community indicators and contemplating uh, how to perhaps focus more deeply and more intentional on some areas. Community foundations and organizations often struggle, uh, you know, you can't be all things to all people. And particularly when you have a community foundation that has the resources, people say, well, look at all the resources you will have. And it's just easier, uh, the easy thing to do is give just a little bit enough to everybody so you keep the most people happy that you can. But at the end of the day, you say, well, where's the impact? What difference has that made? So what we're looking at this year is to, when I say this year, for our next strategic plan, which will, uh, in effect, if approved by the board, will take us from 2019 you know, through, through 2022, um, we're looking at how we can continue to uh, support uh, the broad areas uh, of education, uh, the social services, basic human needs, arts and culture, things that are important and that we've heard are important to uh, all of our communities. But at the same time, figure out, well, the data is telling us here's where the need is the greatest. Here is where uh, the disparities uh, are, 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 are very pronounced in ways that perhaps a targeted focus from the foundation and others may be able to demonstrate an impact over those three years. And then if we see success, we can scale it, or we can deepen it, or we can replicate it. So certainly education will continue to be an area that we will uh, uh, have as a, as a, as a, a focus. Uh, community economic development, um, you know, using the, uh, our work in early childhood. So I don't think you can, should expect a, a significant departure from those areas, but what you would anticipate seeing, and again, subject to approval by the board, is us using data, community indicators, uh, data from a variety of sources, uh, data feedback that we're getting from our stakeholders to zero in and go a little bit deeper and more intentional uh, in some of those areas where the data is showing that we can perhaps have a greater impact. Uh, all the while, we recognize that we have to be and we will remain prepared for the unexpected, the unanticipated. We, we, we always want to be in a, a position, uh, you know, God forbid, when we saw the, the hurricanes uh, that impacted uh, Puerto Rico, and there's a, a large contingent of, of, of a, a connection to Puerto Rico, particularly within the city of Hartford, but even some of the surrounding communities, that we had the resources that were able to help be very uh, immediately respond to the relocation of those families here. So we're always going to have resources uh, that uh, address those issues. Uh, but what we want to do is have a very intentional approach uh, going into this next strategic plan uh, that is really reflective of the data, reflective of those disparities. And we are hopeful that we can make a solid case to the board uh, and, and, and move forward. So it will be somewhat different. It'll look and feel different. We understand that might uh, engender some consternation through the community. But I think when we present it uh, and present how we are still going to have a very comprehensive approach, we're hopeful that it will be receptive and more hopeful that at the over those three years, we'll be able to see, demonstrate, and measure the impact of the investments. And that's really also what our donors are telling us, that they love uh, you know, the community, uh, they trust us with their resources, uh, in a, not but in addition to trusting us with their resources, they also are eager to see the impact of their dollars. And I, I think it's essential, and we owe them nothing less, both to them as donors, but also to our partners and to the communities to say, hey, which, we just don't say, hey, we're the biggest community foundation in the state and one of the biggest in the country. Well, so what if you're not and we're not able to consistently demonstrate why that is of value and how we are being impactful in the areas uh, that are of greatest importance to our stakeholders? Yes. I, I had a question about the strategic plan, and I'm Mary Pelletier, and I actually live in Hartford, but I work on the uh, the Park River Regional Watershed, and 68% of Bloomfield is in the 
in the north branch of the Park River, the drainage basin that stretches east to the Metacomet Ridge to the Connecticut River. And um, the tributaries of Bloomfield are impaired by the time they flow over Hartford City uh, line. And, and so that means they're not swimmable, fishable, or, or drinkable. And, and that's a common problem throughout America. And, and I think that one of the things I hope, and I, th I think this community does too, is that the Hartford Foundation for Public Giving will put the environment and climate change in your strategic plan. And that's gonna be tough because there's only, you know, three years uh, impact. Um, we're talking about reversing 100 years of, of, of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, which, which does impact our rivers. And, and um, but the, I know the, the Hartford Foundation for Public Giving hasn't made the environment a priority because I've been told that the work that we were doing isn't really relevant. In, 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 in t t t and so we've had to work with other partners. Um, but I, I, think, I think this community has really come out for the environment. They've done a lot of awesome things. And, and I don't know if they've signed the Paris Accord, but I think that, that leadership, municipal and, 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 and foundation leadership is needed in order for the next generation to really have a chance. Well, well thank you. And, and again, I, I you know, can't speak to, to the past and, and, and certainly not looking to be critical of that. Uh, but we are here for that purpose, to, to help inform our next strategic plan. And just to be clear, so when I say a three-year strategic plan, that doesn't mean we go three years and then just move on to something else. It means that for those three years, we identify uh, where we can make the impact, how we can have an impact, and build on that. Because you're right, three years isn't enough time to reverse, whether it's you know, damage to the ecosystem or the rivers, or you know, reverse the educational decline. But what it does is allows us to very much study and learn from how we can make a difference. So uh, I'll, I'll stand here and tell you that as the president of the Hartford Foundation, uh, you know, environmental uh, issues uh, are relevant. Uh, they are important to us as a foundation. Uh, they're important because we're not just a foundation. We all live in one of these communities, uh, you know, ourselves, whether it's here in the region or, or, or in the, in somewhere in the state of Connecticut. Uh, we also had a conversation uh, a couple of months ago with a, I can't remember her name, but she's with Sustainable Connecticut, S Sustainable CT, talking about uh, a number of the communities that have signed on uh, to Sustainable CT, which uh, does obviously, well, not obviously, but it, what it does is it lists a number of environmental and ecological uh, concerns, climate change, resilience, and a whole host of things. So it is relevant work. Uh, we're here to be informed about how to uh, ensure that this strategic plan is encompassing of things that are important to uh, the stakeholders and residents. So thank you for sharing that. Yes, sir. Sten Kasperson from Bloomfield. And if I may, I'd like to address two questions to you. Sure. A question and a comment. The first one is uh, relevant to the comment about young families, uh, affordable living, et cetera. On your flyer, and this may be for you or your staff. If it's hard, it's for the staff. If it's easy, it's for me. <laughs> so we'll, we'll go there. The marked decline in the young population over time going forward, mm -hmm. the red line, mm -hmm. can you provide the basis for that? And can you tell us if this is something that's more uh, relevant to Bloomfield than other towns, or right. is this a trend overall? So I can answer the second part. This is a general trend that we've seen overall. Uh, this is a trend, uh, certainly not unique to uh, Bloomfield, not unique to uh, even you know this quarter, the New England, the state of Connecticut. So as we've broken out this data for each of the communities, each of our 29 communities, uh, that has generally been the trend uh, that we've seen young people who, uh, and, and we hear, you hear anecdotally, but you also see in the data, who are uh, you know, not finding either uh, the opportunities for employment uh, and young people who are rediscovering the desire to live uh, in, in urban areas where uh, you know, transportation and connectivity is emphasized and, and are getting away from sort of wanting to have to have a car and live in one place and work in another place. So that's a trend that we've seen. In terms of the data, I don't, did we get this from census? Or is, I don't know if Alyssa's here. Uh, yeah.
for this information was census data source and town by town census data sourcing for the yes. population. Okay. Um, <coughs> All right, that helps. My second point follows up on the, the last two speakers. The word is regionalization. Regionalization. Now we, I, look at that and say, we have a great police department. So does West Hartford. So does Simsbury. All the surrounding the fire departments. Um, MDC is, is overall truly regional. But all of these towns, small, large, they all, all 169, if I believe that's right in Connecticut, they all think they have to have the town hall, the police, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That has to change. Maybe not every aspect needs to change. Everybody needs a mayor and some council people, of course. But does everybody need a full-fledged fire department? Just as an example, can you, respond, can you uh, address how Hartford Foundation can help with that, or I, at least enter the, uh, enter the ring on the subject? I, I can't, and I'm smiling and, and laughing because, I mean, that, you know, you have put that in the most, uh, you know, succinct and, 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 and um, compelling way. Uh, I heard uh, one of my colleagues, David Griggs, who was a new president of the, Hartford, of the Metro Hartford Alliance, say this as we were on a panel, and I, it was my experience. He said he, he was here 10 minutes uh, locating, relocating from Minneapolis, uh, and within 10 minutes, the first thing he learned was Connecticut has 169 towns, uh, and he should never forget that. Uh, each of those towns, unique, special uh, places, and, 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 and have a very rightful claim to that pride. Uh, that being said, uh, it is also, uh, it can be a very much a detriment. And I'm smiling and laughing because as uh, a former mayor of a city very similar to Hartford, surrounded by lots of other smaller uh, communities, well, not smaller like inferior, but just smaller size and smaller population, uh, I had to stop using the term regionalism because, I mean, it just... It was, when I said regionalism, they heard, oh, the mayor of Youngstown wants to pawn the city of Youngstown's problems out onto Boardman, Canfield, Austintown, Poland, which are the equivalent of, of some of these towns. Uh, and, uh, you know, we moved away. Those are city problems, and you guys got to figure it out. And don't get me wrong. I mean, city, every town, every city has self-inflicted issues, and we don't always do ourselves a, a, a justice by how we address some of those things. But you are right. Investment people from on the outside, issues don't define themselves to municipal borders. You know, uh, economic investment of the challenge, and you spoke about this, the tributaries that flow from Bloomfield don't all of a sudden say, oh, we're about to cross over into Hartford, so now all of a sudden we're impaired. Those issues are issues of regional relevance. So to the extent, uh, it, it's almost as if you were sitting in some of our discussions, as we talk about uh, this, uh, our place, we very much believe that we have an obligation to use our bully pulpit, our platform, to start raising our voice even more consistently on issues of regional importance. Uh, we can't dictate, and we're not in a place to dictate to uh, towns what they should or shouldn't be doing, but to the extent we can incentivize that, to the extent that we can bring together discussions of other areas that have figured out how to be more regionally relevant and cooperate in a regional way, and regional cooperation doesn't mean erasing or eradicating or diminishing the history of Bloomfield or, or Tallinn or, 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 or uh, Marlboro or any of the, our communities. Uh, you know, that's still very much to be embraced, but it does say, how about a question of services? Does it really matter when you call 911? Does it really matter whether that 911 center is in Bloomfield or Avon or you just know that you want immediate re competent response? Where technologically it's routed to and from is, is less relevant than the, the, the first responder showing up at your door. But I've seen this because communities get caught up in, you know, Youngstown had its 911 center at City Hall. Literally across the street, Mahoning County had its 911 center. Five minutes away, Boardman had its, I mean, and it, it was, they were all multi-million dollar operations. Uh, because people thought, oh, if somehow it doesn't sit in my backyard, it's going to diminish the quality of life. So we are increasingly using our platform to both incentivize, to speak to, to help convene conversations around that, uh, speaking to that even at the state issue, issues uh, that as the state makes some of its decisions, and some of that 
uh, you know, lack of cooperation is the way that the state operates and the way the state distributes some of its resources. So tough decisions have to be made. Uh, but to the extent that each one of you uh, has an opportunity to, to, to vote and to, to, to raise your voice, that's important. You know, we are a nonpartisan uh, you know, organization by, by law and by definition. Uh, so we advocate in, in issues that are nonpartisan issues. Uh, and, and this really, I'm not, this isn't even a partisan issue itself. So yes, that is a, a, one of the things that we are considering how to uh, ensure is a part of our strategic plan, a part of our actions and our activities. And this is also something, and I can say it's, it's been refreshing that we've heard. So we've had 12 of these, probably in um, almost each of the previous 11, we've heard people express a love for their town, but also an importance of being connected to the region, a recognition. Uh, that this is a region. We will rise or fall as a region. We are defined as a region whether you know, we, we, we like it or accept it or not. So when it comes to economic opportunity, when it comes to being able to improve uh, services, uh, you know, anything from again, safety services to uh, even if you wanted to set aside that for a moment, I mean, basic services like you know, refuse collection and recycling and, and, and other things, or, or, or the dog catch. I mean, you, really, you just, as a citizen, want and understand that you're paying for. You know, so you, you want to pay a fair price and get a good service, uh, and that can be accomplished in many instances through more collaborative efforts. So uh, we do think we have a role, uh, and, and the more that we hear that from our donors, constituents, I think the more it validates that approach. So uh, it is very much a part of our thinking. And, and, and you know, sticking our neck out, and that means that some people may disagree, but uh, that's okay because we have heard that as a priority more and more uh, from uh, people from across each of the communities that we've had an opportunity to engage. So thank you for sharing. Yes, she just put her hand up. Good evening. My name is Angeline Crossdale, and I have been in Bloomfield for 17 years. Uh, <laughs> not as long as some people, but... <laughs> Um, near and dear to my heart is the education process that we have in Bloomfield for the public schools. And thank you for supporting with $673,758. We appreciate that. Um, what's lacking in Bloomfield currently is after school enrichment, academic enrichment um, programs. We don't have any. Um, after school academic enrichment programs. Um, there's sports and you know those type of enrichment programs throughout the um, public schools, but nothing academic. No after school math enrichment, language enrichment, science enrichment programs. And I see that you donate a lot of money each year uh, or for the last three years. Um, so and I hear you talk about incentivize. So I'm going to ask um, or encourage you when you donate again that you incentivize the public schools to um, come up with some sort of a, a academic enrichment after school um, programs from kindergarten to middle school, so up to high school too, if thank possible. You, thank you. Uh, we would welcome that conversation. And, and part of what we uh, find is that there are conversations and ideas that start here, that obviously with limited time, you know, we can't uh, get more extensive. But one of the things I would uh, encourage you to do is we would welcome you know, continuing that conversation about how that approach, not only with the schools, and obviously they play a critical role, but through partnering with uh, nonprofit organizations. And there are a number of uh, scenarios where organizations, uh, sometimes within the school, other times not within the school, do have those academic uh, after school enrichment programs. Uh, Jackie Coleman is here as she leads uh, along with her team our uh, academic investment. So I would encourage you to contact Jackie, and, and, and Bloomfield is in your portfolio, right, Jackie? So it is now. So, <laughs> see? <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Yes, ma'am. My name is Bruce Marchetti. I'm a newcomer. I've only been here six years, but I love <laughs> this place. And uh, one of the things I wanted to say is I thank you for all the work you've done already. I love the land trust. You've made an impact there and certainly the Historical Society and the library. But I want to talk, and it piggybacks a little on, on the kids. Uh, we, we lost an opportunity to have a new library, and I'm not going to go there again. I don't want to cry. But the fact is the library is the one place in town that is non-denominational, non-denominational, 
Pinal. <laughs> yeah, that. <laughs> and and um, it's free. And anybody can go there. And, and when you read about people who talk about a library card changed my life, you know, it's, it's so important. And this is not to plug the library, but rather in the historical society, we have things that happen. We take tours. And every now and then when we can squeeze the money for a bus, we take kids on tours to see the beginnings of the town. And then they go over to places they haven't lived. And they go, God, I've never seen this. Oh my God. You know, and it's so nice. And likewise, I know we have librarians who go to the school, and we've gotten money to have school kids bus to the library. But I think a lot about teenagers, and, and though we do not have a teen center in our library, someday we will, and real programs that could happen, but kids can't always get there. Right. And if there were some after school thing, there's free stuff at our farm that's spectacular. If more kids could bus over and do it, if more kids could go on the history tours. If, I, I just think some kind of a special bus allowance because the school is doing the best it can on, on educating their children, but the town itself has a lot to offer. I, I would imagine that, that Cigna would be very happy to have some kids go over and tour. You gotta get them there and gas is expensive. But I think the idea of celebrating what we do have here with a lot of adults who love this place. Right. And the kids are open. You know, I say get them before they shut. Mm -hmm. So, bus money. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, we, we would welcome that. Uh, again, and we do support programs that uh, provide uh, and facilitate transportation of kids and students. A uh, uh, month and a half ago, we were out in uh, Canton at the Roaring Brook Nature Center, uh, and that very issue came up. Of, of, of kids from various communities being able to come out and see within a half hour drive a whole new world, a world that they didn't know existed in their own backyard. So uh, we do support uh, those types of initiatives and programs. And again, would welcome uh, a, a conversation about what uh, might be in place that we could help uh, expand or scale, what might not be in place that can be replicated. Uh, because the more you uh, open, like I said, open the kids' eyes, expose them to their community. And I'm going through this myself. So my, my wife and I, and we, we've been here for 10 months and I go places and then I, you know, I come home and, and say, boy, Ethan, you know, guess where I just went? And whether it's the, the nature center or, or now our farms, all the places that we are, you know, 15 or 20 minutes away from here, not even that far, uh, but that introduce us to a whole new world. So I can imagine how exhil exhilarating for young people who have been here for the, all the majority of their lives to go, you know, five or 10 or 20 or 30 minutes away and discover that this is a part of their community too. So we absolutely support those types of things and would welcome, uh, you know, a conversation of how to collaborate between the schools and some of the other organizations. Yes. Uh, Paula Jones, I've been here, I think, 26 years. Um, and first of all, I echo what everybody said before, I agree with. Um, I'm on the board of the Land Trust, and first of all, I, I want to acknowledge the fact that Hartford Foundation for Public Giving has supported us on a couple of really wonderful acquisition projects, right uh, Hawk Hill Farm for one, and that's just wonderful in terms of connectivity. It's land that's open to everybody. Um, and it's great for the critters as well. Um, I grew up in Maine and I see far more wildlife in Bloomfield, Connecticut than I saw in Maine ever. Um, I want to echo what Ruth, Ruth Ann said. Um, I think with respect to the environment, um, I had a, a wonderful childhood and I had access to the outdoors and it just gave me a completely different appreciation and understanding of the importance of the environment. And I feel like um, a lot of kids in Bloomfield don't have that opportunity. Um, they're rightfully fearful of things like ticks, I get that. Um, maybe bears not so much. So um, to Ruth Ann's point about having enrichment programs and ways that um, more people could access some of the wonderful um, resources that are available in Bloomfield, that would be great. So that's one point. Um, the other thing I want to mention, though, is I went to a really wonderful um, fundraising event the other night that um, Waypoint Spirits put together a couple of the partners for the Hyacinth Williams Foundation. That's the backpack program um, that, uh, you know, gets kids food over the weekend if they don't have enough to eat. 
Um, it's a wonderful program, and I guess the point I'm making is that, you know, it's hard for kids to get excited about enrichment programs, be it the library or academics or the environment if you're hungry. Right. So I think that is still a problem in Bloomfield. Um, I'm somewhat insulated from it, but I think those things are really important as well. I appreciate well. you sharing that, and, and again, it's almost as if this is, this is, ref this is energizing, inspiring, because about two hours ago we were sitting uh, the executive team and I were sitting in the conference room uh, really talking about the framework of our, our strategic plan. So to be able to share some of that thinking with you, but more importantly, to hear some of what you're saying is validating uh, the conversations that we were wrestling with. Uh, and you identified you know, the basic human needs, right? All the enrichment programs, transportation, exposure to the wilderness uh, will be for not you know, if the kid, the student, uh, is, is hunger. You know, that's the focus of just survival. So the notion that while we are putting forward uh, the things that we talked about in education and, and, and workforce, that we very much are remaining uh, centrally committed to those basic human needs. Uh, and that is something that uh, we have heard in other communities. That they say that when you, and this was, I think we were in, um, I was in, we were in Simsbury. Uh, it was either one of the listening sessions or I was there for something else. And they say, you know, if you look at the demographics of our community, you see, you know, the median housing prices, you see the median income, and it's, you know, uh, higher than, than, than the area average. If you look at, you know, the vehicles, if you just took a snapshot, you would not think that this is a community uh, that is uh, uh, experiencing some of those issues. Uh, so, but what they were saying is that people are experiencing it uh, who might, you know, live in a house that is a house that could be on a cover of better homes and gardens. Uh, but the reality of the struggle that is existing, and it's a quiet struggle, and they talked about, you know, there's this notion of that we all have the dignity and, 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 and pride that is a good thing, but there is that it was, they were disinclined to want to take advantage of some of those because they said, well, that's not, you know, they, they have a picture of, of just a different uh, a type of experience when they think of the need to uh, hunger and things like that. So I appreciate you highlighting that, and it really validates while we are being very uh, focused on some areas of need in terms of education and community economic development, the basic human needs, uh, you know, aren't simply just issues that some people say, well, that's a, that's a, a Hartford issue or that's a, you know, a, a, an East Hartford issue. That's an issue of you know, virtually every community, there, you know, in some way, shape, or form. So to the extent that we uh, work with others uh, to address those and then build upon that, you know, we talk about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, it's those basic needs we have to address first before we can you know, move up the pyramid. So thank you. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Gail Nolan. I'm the director of the Family Resource Center in Bloomfield. So Very good. I have one of the basic uh, human needs grants for you, and it does work wonders in town. You know, this past year we, we gave out winter coats to children. We gave out um, presents to a family who was going through a really hard time. Mother lost her job, had medical issues. Um, you helped us start a diaper bank in town. Um, you gave us enough slots so that we could fund um, 60 children with diapers every month. We worked with the Alliance for Bloomfield's Children. We now, can, we now are um, doing 100 uh, children a month Good. with diapers. Um, everybody struggles with diapers. Everybody can remember how much those cost, how much wipes, formula, baby food. We work with our social, service, social news services to also give out some... Um, formula and baby food, things like that to the families. So we're really you know, trying to work with, um, with all those things. Um, we also work with the Hartford Foundation with the Early Childhood um, Partnership on home daycare providers mm -hmm. in town. So we have a small um, grant that we're working with and empowering them. We're going into their homes and giving them coaching, um, bringing up the quality of their programs, working with the preschools. So we really do appreciate that. We see a, a great growth in our community, looking to train some of the providers to also give back to the other providers. Um, 
And then I just want to mention with the Alliance for Bloomfield's Children, along with um, looking at early childhood things, we're also looking at racial and economic equity. And we've been working with um, the Graustein Memorial Fund in Hamden mm -hmm. and in partnership with them. And the Alliance for Bloomfield's Children also works with the Harvard Foundation on early childhood. Um, but doing cafe conversations, doing trainings, doing all kinds of things for Bloomfield, working on those issues. So Thank we you. hope those continue. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I can imagine I'm not continuing with, with Richard Sussman. You know, he would, I would never hear the end of that. So uh, he and his team, uh, the enthusiasm that, that, that they put forward, uh, you know, to that on a daily basis is, is just really inspiring. So thank you for sharing that with us. Thank you. So Richard, did, 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 that was this, did Richard make sure that you had that? Was that part of, I, I know it wasn't. I know it wasn't. <laughs> yes. Is this okay? Oh, I'm sorry, I'll come to you next. Oh, you have, the, you have the mic? Okay, we'll go here and then up front. Okay. I would hope so. Thank you. <laughs> I'm Angelique Crosdale and I um, have lived in Broomfield for the last 16 years. I have never heard a conversation in Bloomfield around HIV and AIDS or hepatitis C or opium overdose. And Bloomfield, the HIV cases has increased. Um, I spoke to a teen in the school system a couple weeks ago, and he asked me what was hives. HIV, he didn't even know what HIV is, he asked, what was hives? So I think the conversation needs to happen from the ground up, and there needs to be a communi some community um, outreach or efforts to educate our residents around that there's a cure for hepatitis C, especially among the baby boomers. I'm not sure if people are getting screened or even know that there is a cure for hep C. Um, and uh, I think people are a little bit um, comfortable because the services are happening in Hartford and it's not in our beautiful town of Bloomfield. And so they're so far, it might seem a little bit far removed, but it's ever so present in our own backyard and in our own your homes. Right. So I, I really think that Bloomfield need to wake up and, and, and recognize that um, the conversations need to be had um, because our youths are becoming infected with HIV at a greater rate. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Uh, you know, one of the things that this community, that this region has is uh, some, uh, you know, very highly regarded, um, you know, healthcare facilities, uh, both in terms of uh, those that happen to have their main facilities, uh, you know, centered uh, in Hartford, but they certainly don't re relegate themselves to serving only Hartford. So to the extent that public health and the well-being of communities and those conversations uh, can happen uh, at all levels, uh, because it's not by the time you walk into an emergency room or, or wait for the hospital program in itself, uh, it is often too late. And to the uh, example that the young lady gave that things that we might take for granted that have been in our lexicon for years, uh, young people not even knowing uh, you know, the, 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 the basics uh, around that uh, information uh, and, and how that then can perpetuate dangerous choices or ill-informed choices or uh, deferral of care. So again, that's why we're here is to uh, ensure that we have our uh, fingers on the pulse of some of the needs in the community and how that can be addressed uh, through partnerships with organizations uh, here, whether they're here in, in Bloomfield or they're elsewhere in the region, but very much serve uh, the residents of Bloomfield. Thank you for sharing. Yes, ma'am. Hi, first, uh, thank you. Um, I'm Robin Sherwood. I've lived in Bloomfield for 27 years, I think, and grew up in Hartford. So a lot of what I want to talk about is, well, what makes a town or a city vibrant? And I don't have a bucket list, but I have a wish list for Bloomfield. And Bloomfield, I love Bloomfield for a lot of reasons. I love it because it's, it's more integrated than a lot of other surrounding towns. And, and because I grew up in Hartford and had the advantage of knowing what it's like to be in a relatively small city, but that had a lot to offer despite its struggles. Um, and I see Bloomfield kind of in the same light. It's a great town, has a lot to offer, has a lot of open space. Um, and thank you for your contribution to the Winterberry Land Trust, uh, which I'm a member of. And I'm also involved with uh, Ironwood Community Properties, or partners. Partners, thank you. <laughs> Anyhow, but what I'm getting at is 
what I feel makes a small town or, or even a small city vibrant is the town center. The town center is so important in Bloomfield Town Center. As much as I like it, I think aesthetically it's lacking. It's got, you know, a lot of ma little malls with a lot of big parking lots, ugly parking lots in the front of the buildings. Now I know you can't necessarily knock them all down and start all over again, but you know, so maybe beautif beautifying mm -hmm. the town center aesthetically, plantings, whatever, even within the parking lots, outdoor cafe seating. Um, the Italian patisserie is, you know, a great little place that people even come to from out of town. Um, so I think about those types of things. Sidewalks, Bloomfield Center again is a little tricky uh, because of the way the buildings are situated. It's a little dangerous, in my opinion. Bike paths, we don't seem to have any bike paths. West Hartford's gotten on the ball, Hartford's gotten on the ball. Uh, I live on Duncaster Road, and Duncaster Road is also now, uh, it seems like super popular people come there, park there from out of town to bike down Duncaster, because it's a, basically a five mile stretch. But there are still no bike paths, or, you know, and there's no shoulder, so that's kind of a dangerous mm -hmm. situation. Uh, so, like I said, instead of my, my bucket list, my, my wish list for Bloomfield are bike paths, sidewalks, um, and then my crazy idea is to bring back the trolley. Bring, bring back a trolley <laughs> to go from Bloomfield Center to Hartford, straight down Bloomfield Avenue into the center of Hartford um, and back. Now, I know, again, logistically, maybe that's, you know, but wouldn't that be cool? You know, and that would even help, you know, youth. What do youth want to do? What do they enjoy? Right. You know, and we struggle with the fact that, yeah, we have an aging population, youth that want to move on, move out, go wherever the jobs are. Right. But, you know, these are things, Windsor seems to be doing a lot more to attract youth to the center of town. So I think about these things. And that's pretty much it. I mean, if we could, do something about those parking lots in the center of town. I think that might be a start. Well, clearly you're not alone in the support of others uh, in your wish list. A part of what, you know, so this is, is, is not uncommon, and we've heard this notion of towns that value their town center, the feel and, and what that says about the community and, and how it becomes a gathering or a focal point. Uh, and part of what we are contemplating is how can we uh, as a foundation, uh, make an investment uh, in the community that the community can then begin pursuing some of those things uh, and, and it can begin leveraging an investment. So part of uh, what we hope to do is, is, is really taking this and, and putting this uh, you know, on the table in discussions uh, with uh, you know, our board and, and, and figuring out how the resources that we have, because part of what we'd like to be able to do is you're spending a lot of your time and, and effort and energy uh, tonight with us. You all have demanding schedules and, and busy families and, and, and a whole host of other places you could have been, but we don't take for granted that uh, you know, you're coming and having this conversation with us. And this is by no means a, us checking a box and saying, okay, we've got Bloomfield, we've got you know, 17 other communities and they're gonna pat ourselves on the back and, 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 and that be it. Uh, we see this as uh, the beginning, you know, we've had ongoing conversations, but the beginning of a new ongoing conversation. And, and, and are looking at something that we can leave behind as a token of our appreciation as a result of hearing what you're saying. So things like that, uh, we are figuring out what we can do, uh, again, to put a seed in the ground that would then allow the community to begin pursuing some of those ideas. And, and again, it, your ideas, you know, you all as a, as a town and community uh, will have to figure out how to, uh, you know, bring that consensus but we are very much contemplating, and, and one of the things that I'll, I'll, I'll give you a little insight to is at uh, the end of this year in, uh, you know, likely November, you'll, you'll, you'll be notified, is we have our annual uh, gathering, which is an opportunity for us to reflect and appreciate, express appreciation to our donors, partners, stakeholders, every individual who has uh, participated in one of our listing sessions is going to be invited uh, and that is going to be an opportunity for us to, uh, you know, give back a little bit of what we've heard, 
demonstrate how it has helped to inform our strategic plan. And we also hope to you know, begin to use that as an opportunity to, in some tangible way, uh, show uh, our appreciation to the towns and the individual, the towns collectively made up of individuals who came out uh, that I think really start speaking to some of the individual things the town would want to do and us figuring out how we can help those things along in a way that you know, would be, really show we heard you and, and we are really in this for the long term with you. So st stay tuned. Thank you. Yes, sir. I'll come back up. Hi, thank you. Good evening. My name is Rickford Curtin, Deputy Mayor Bloomfield, and I thank you for being here tonight. Yes, sir. I want to, top, I want to touch on two topics, um, talking about um, enrichment programs outdoors and regionalism, but I'll start with the outdoor programs. I have two young kids. I have a 10-year-old son and an 8-year-old daughter. My daughter was lucky to get into Winterbury Magnet School that partners with our farm, so she had a lot of experience being outdoors, Farm, farm animals, and that experience really helped. And I can tell you this much, seeing my son and my daughter when they're outdoors, he's basically <laughs> like, get me back into the car. <laughs> and, <laughs> and my daughter's mostly running after snakes and insects and all that good stuff. So because he didn't have that experience by going to Winterbury Maggot School, I think it's important for us to have those programs for our young people. And I would love to talk to you about that because I, I believe it's important. Good. Uh, regionalism, for an example, we're competing for limited resource. So what you have, I call it a gladi gladiator system in place, where you have these larger towns with smaller towns competing for the same resources. So I think it's important for us to emphasize and for us to fight that fight to make sure that we're kind of collaborating and not this town have its own superintendent. This, so I think that's an important fight, and I would encourage you to fight that fight. And I appreciate that, Thank particularly you. coming from uh, an elected official, uh, where that is not always popular. Uh, you know, you, as elected official, you have your constituents. They anticipate and expect for you to represent their interests. Uh, but doing that isn't mutually exclusive to then also saying we are a region. And to the extent that we can grow the pie or collaborate as a region, uh, not at the expense of the residents of Bloomfield who, who, who elected you, uh, but to say, yeah, you know, that means compromise. That means there a little bit of give and take. So uh, I appreciate that. And in terms of the enrichment programs, uh, Jackie Coleman is sitting to your left uh, and, 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 and would be happy to continue that conversation. Yes, ma'am. Um, hi, thank you very much for being here and everyone for coming. This, I love Bloomfield and this is why. It's just such a great turnout and there's so many great ideas that I almost didn't have to say any of them of, of mine because they've been said, but I just wanted to piggyback on um, the town center. That's a really, really important thing um, to me also. And I would like to repeat the idea about affordable housing. Bloomfield is so unique because of our diversity and we really need to have racial and economic equity right up at the top. And we have an amazing opportunity here because of the community that already exists to really lean into those issues. And I'm really grateful to hear about the work that you're doing. Um, I want it to be more town-wide, and I think the new council is really taking some steps in that direction. But it would be great to have um, your input and your ideas as you're going through this program. Um, and the other thing I wanted to mention was that environmentally, I don't know if everybody knows, but we're actually ready to start digging in the ground for two sections of a bike walk path, which will be part of the Greenway. And it's going to be, it's been 10 years that there are people in the room who've been working for 10 years, I see some of you, and we're finally going to see that start to happen. It will be open for everybody. It's going to bring people into Bloomfield. It's going to allow for a lot more outdoor things for Rickford's kids. Maybe your son will get into it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and for that, there are things that, that we could really also build on the kind of environmental awareness that's happened in this town because of issues in the last three years that politicized and radicalized a lot of us. So people from all different parts of the town have been working together. There's really simple things like refillable water bottle stations throughout the town mm -hmm. or bike racks, now that we're gonna have a bikeway to come throughout the town, that we really need to make those things available so we all learn how to have options because unless we have them, we can't change. And I think Bloomfield could really set the, you know, it, it, it would be great to have this happen in this model community because we already have so much energy behind that. 
But I think in the town center, we've got to include affordable housing. We have to have a town center that's vibrant and is really available to everybody because we don't have that now. There's a lot of separation in our town and we need to really you know, acknowledge that and, and look to other communities or to you or to other people with the council and look at design review programs so we can really use great ideas from other cities or towns right. and tackle it straight on by talking about it and bring it to the table. So thank you. I, I, I can't tell you. Oh, I'm sorry, don't no, let me interrupt your applause. <laughs> I can't tell you how exhilarating it is to, to hear um, citizens of this town uh, of different ethnicities and races and socioeconomic backgrounds so credibly, authentically, and, 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 and with such a level of comfort talk about you know, the importance of, of diversity and equity. Uh, racial equity, socioeconomic equity. You know, it, it, is, it has been a, a conversation that this country we know has struggled with for generations and communities for generations and, and, and towns and states. And, you know, and, and we see, uh, you know, the, the, the debate and the dialogue online and on TV. But to, you know, to be here and have this talked about with such passion, uh, equally whether it's coming from, you know, and again, it doesn't matter what, a persuasion it's coming from, that same level of commitment to that notion of racial equity and inclusion and, 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 and diversity uh, is, is just a testament uh, you know, to uh, how special this town is, that people are openly talking about it, where the challenges exist, and a commitment to doing something about it. Uh, I, you know, I just, so kudos to all of you. Um, what I would say is I would, you know, we would be happy to talk about the, th the things you talked about in terms of affordable housing, the bike pass, the town center, what's in my experience is, is important for a community to have is to have a vision and, and a plan that really begins to put those things you know, down such that you know, not that you're going to get 100% consensus, but that you can start building community consensus. So when resources and opportunities present themselves, you know, okay, we've sort of laid out what we would like the town center to look like generally that we would like you know, the bike paths and the things. And then a plan that sort of talks about how we begin to accomplish those things. So as you then, you know, and it doesn't happen over the course of six months or a year, you know, these things, as you talked about, the, the, bike, the planning for the bike trail. But five years and 10 years is gonna come whether we do anything about it or not. Time is moving on. So to the extent that the community coalesces around a vision and a plan of what does Bloomfield want to look like in five years? What do we want the town center to have? What are some of the amenities, whether the water refilling station, whatever they happen to be? And what are then areas that we can leverage resources, whether it's from the foundation, corporate, uh, you know, public resources, private resources? I would very much encourage you all to, as a town to consider you know, a visioning process and that it comes along with a very pragmatic plan that puts those things so it helps keep everyone on the same page. You know, the elected officials, you know, uh, you, you, crisis has come, you gotta put fires out. Uh, you know, you, mayor, council, five years from now, if there's a new mayor or a different council, that the community says, this is what our, where our consensus lies. This is what we expect the town to work toward. Public, private, here's what we're doing. And it also identifies places for people to buy into that. Because I used to tell people when I was in office, you know, we have a role as City Hall, but if I ask people, you know, understand that if you're simply waiting for City Hall, the mayor and city council, that's going to be a very long wait. We understand we have a role and an obligation, but we also need the energy and the passion and the talent of the constituents and the citizens and the nonprofit stakeholders and the corporate community. When we did that in Youngstown, Ohio, it was a transformative moment that lasted for a decade plus. It didn't mean that we fixed all the problems. We still had crime issues and this issue. But that was a defining moment in you know, my own life, both personally and professionally, to see a town that I grew up in that was defined by the rise and fall of an industry that spent 20 years waiting for something, to, somebody to do something about it. When the town and the city finally came together under a vision and a plan, it transformed uh, you know, the community in ways that I could, even to this day, that was, back in uh, early 2000s, and the plan was called Youngstown 2010. So here we are in 2018, uh, you know, 15 to 18 years beyond uh, when we started that. And while Youngstown is still a struggling city, 
the transformation that happens. So I can only imagine a town like Bloomfield uh, that you know coalesces around that sort of approach. You know, the the, the results uh, you know I think would be transformative. So we have about three or four more minutes. Uh, Want to get as many as we can and, and respectful of your time. So yes. Uh, Mark Saunders, I've been in Bloomfield here now for uh, 25 years. And um, I'm wondering if the foundation has ever looked at any kind of a, uh, I don't know what it would look like, but a plan that would get um, musical instruments into the hands of, of young children that don't have those available to them. And I'm, uh, could be band instruments and things like that, but you know, I, I, I grew up with Jimi Hendrix and Eric Clapton, so you know, like, like inexpensive. Grew up with them? I mean, like those were your no, I wish, I wish. Oh, okay, I, I wish. All no. right. In my imagination, I did believe me. <laughs> yes, I spent many hours with you got them. Got it out on the back lawn. Or yeah, that. you bet. So uh, I don't. Again, I don't know what it would look like, but um, some kind of a, a program that would get instruments into the hands of children that. Um, are looking for something like that. It, it would give. It gave me a lot of focus, and I think it would. It would help. Um, it would help. The answer is yes. We have donors that have uh, very much uh, targeted and provided resources uh, to get instruments into the hands of of students and kids. So uh, again, I would encourage you to reach out uh, either you know to our community investment folks, and um, you know we can share you know where, what that's looked like in other towns and other communities. Uh, donors that might have that interest, so absolutely yes. Yep. Let's see your hand up also. Yeah. Um, I'm Sharon. I've lived in this town 50 years, and I have a question maybe to the community. I'm so excited to see so many people here, is that I love this community because we all come together. We have potluck dinners, we have nonprofits that bring people together, and we can't always get money from the Hartford Foundation. So what comes next is volunteers. And I find it very hard to understand why we don't get more volunteers to show up for events, to show up to help make an event happen. Um, we are the people, we are what makes happen. And how do we go about that? Is there some kind of uh, research that's been done on this? I've been involved from uh, 50 years ago when I was on the Peace, Board, uh, Peace Train Foundation to starting a theater group. And all these things have evolved through the years. And often I see the very same people at everything. And we have many, many faces in this town. And we are diverse, and I love that diversity. But how do we bring us all together so that we can show up at something where there's not just 10 people, but there's 70 people. How does that happen, and how can we make that happen more for the future? I unfortunately do not have an easy answer. I can tell you in every one of the previous 11 meetings, that issue has arisen. Every one of the meetings, people who are passionate uh, but say, we need more volunteers. So because we've heard it at now 12 meetings, uh, you know, to the extent that we can help facilitate a conversation around that, how to encourage, how to inspire volunteerism. Uh, if there is research from other communities uh, within the state or across the country or anywhere else that we can find, uh, we will certainly bring that to bear uh, for those. So it is a universal uh, challenge and, and concern uh, for those that show up, you know, great, and, and, and knowing that there are others who who uh, you know, might be inclined to if reached out or connected in some way. So uh, again, we've heard it, 12 consecutive sessions. So you know, to the extent that we can you know, tap into some of our peer institutions, our other community foundations across the country to ask them, have they figured that out? Uh, and then to share that, we will absolutely do that. So thank you. So it is uh, a few minutes past seven. We're running a few minutes late. Thank you. We can't thank you enough for, for coming out and showing up and sharing. Uh, and, and, and stay tuned, there is more to come as a result of this conversation. Thank you all very much.